Hi friends, Sharon Thomas here from Established Footsteps Ministry. You know, in our Me and My Bible Bible study, we have been immersing ourselves for the last couple of months in the gospel story as found in Matthew 26, 27, and 28. And every month as we finish out a time of study, I love to come on for a few moments and just gather with you around that passage and just share some things. And my prayer is that what God leads me to share is going to confirm and affirm some things in your heart and mind that he's already been speaking to you, but also give you some fresh things to ponder as well as we round out the month and finish it out and move on to another passage. So for these chapters, Matthew 26, 27, and 28, there's so much to consider. There's so many things that I could share about, and it's really been a rich time uh, to be in these passages, the gospel story, the center of our salvation, of Jesus being led to the cross, his time on the cross, his resurrection. I mean, these have been just so uh, rich for us to be in, especially during the time of Easter. And then also uh, during this season where our world is just in the middle of crisis with COVID-19. So my prayer is that the Lord has really been using this passage to ground you and steady you and just center you in the gospel story. And like I said, there's so many things that I could share about because of that. It's been really rich for me and I pray it has been for you as well. But one thing that has come back to me again and again and again is to watch and pray. Now you might be thinking already, well, I thought you shared on that last month when we were in Matthew 26 and uh, part of 27, and I did. I did share on that last month, but I wanna come back around to it this month again and look at it from a different perspective. See, last month, it was really about how we can watch and pray, and we're gonna talk about that a little bit. But really, this month, I want us to talk about how Jesus did that, how Jesus watched and prayed. You know, as I have been uh, meditating in these chapters right along with you in this study, one of the things that has just really mesmerized me and just gotten my attention again and again and again is the self-control that Jesus exhibits. Now, for a girl who doesn't always have self-control, I'm always in awe of people who can really pull it off. And Jesus really pulls it off again and again and again. I saw it and I just was like, how does he do that? I mean, he exhibits such self-control in that he really didn't say much at all. I mean, here he is, the word of life. Like he has words, right? But he hardly spoke a word as he is being tortured. And these people are treating him so brutally. I was amazed at the self-control that he had to be able to love in spite of everything that was going on. He just continued to have that self-control to be able to, to um, focus his love upon people who were being so hateful to him, to stay focused on his mission when he was undergoing so much physical and emotional pain. There's so much self-control in that. And for him to not be selfish, not once in all of it. I mean, I was and still am and probably will be for the rest of my life mesmerized by that. But as I was pondering it and just in it day after day, it really just got my attention and caused me to continue to ask the question, how does he do that? How does he do that? And maybe you like me have been asking that as well. And one of the things that God really deposited in my heart is that Jesus took on the curse of death, but he did not take on the effects of death. He never sinned. He never joined in with the effects of death. Oh, he stepped into the death that's all around us and he took that curse upon himself, but he never took on the effects of death. And I think the reason that he was able to do that, the reason he was able to stay in that place of self-control and not fall into sin and not fall into just taking matters into his own hands and striving, the reason he could do that, I believe, and what I've come to believe is that it was because he knew how to watch and pray. As we gather today, I wanna to take you into a section from Matthew 27, and we're gonna do that in just a minute. We're gonna read there. But first of all, I want to mention a passage to you that was a prophecy of Jesus back in the Old Testament, and we find it in Isaiah chapter 
11. There's quite a few verses there that just really speak about what the Messiah was going to be like. But one of the verses says this about him. He says, it says, he does not judge by what his eyes see or his ears hear, but in righteousness he will judge the nations. And you know, that tells us that yes, Jesus came in the form of a man. He felt all that we feel, we know that about him. And yet, even though he took on human flesh, he did not judge and respond and react to situation based on what his eyes saw or what his ears heard, but he did so in righteousness. And that's exactly what we're gonna see here in this part that I'm gonna read for you. It's from Matthew 27. Starting in verse 27, we'll go through verse 32. It says, Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the praetorium. This was right after he had been, you know, before Pilate, and they had decided to crucify him, and everybody was screaming, Crucify him, crucify him. So it says, Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the praetorium, and they gathered the whole Roman cohort around him, and they stripped him, and they put a scarlet robe on him. And after weaving a crown of thorns, they put it on his head and a reed in his right hand. And they kneeled down before him and they mocked him saying, Hail, King of the Jews. And they spat on him and took the reed and they began to beat him on the head. And after they had mocked him, they took his robe off and put his garments on him and led him away to crucify him. And as they were coming out, they found a man of Cyrene named Simon, who they pressed into service to bear his cross. Those are just such horrible moments. Like we love Jesus with all our heart. We've come to know Jesus. And I, you know, I hate violence of any kind. I hate mocking. I hate, but when I read this and I see that they did this to Jesus and the self-control that he exhibited, how was he able to do that? How was he able to do that? There's five things that I want to really mention as we, as we just kind of work through here and talk about each one. To think about how he did that and what was he watching. So if he was watching and praying, if he was in that spirit of watching and praying, and I believe that he was because he had instructed his disciples to do that, so I think he was doing it himself, what was he seeing? If Isaiah 11 tells us that he does not judge by what his eyes see or his ears hear, then what was he looking at when all of these things were happening? There's five things I really want to mention. First of all, we're told in verse 27 that the whole Roman cohort, cohort, that's a word I don't use often, but basically all of the soldiers, right? They all gathered around him, kind of like a circle of dogs, like ready to pounce on their prey. If you've ever felt surrounded by an enemy, well, Jesus felt that. And yet, I wonder what he was watching in that moment. I wonder what his eyes were seeing. As I meditated on this throughout the month, different things the Lord would show me. One of them is this, that maybe instead of seeing those, uh, those soldiers gathered around him, he saw what we read about in other parts of scripture, an army of angels gathered around him. So he wasn't judging by what his eyes saw or his ears heard. I mean, he was going to begin to hear these soldiers that were gathered around him just leveling accusations at him. And he had already just heard a whole crowd of people screaming, crucify him, crucify him. But maybe as these soldiers gathered around, what he was watching instead, as he prayed to his father, was the angel armies that were gathered around him. And he certainly knew what those angel armies looked like, didn't he? He had been in heaven. He knows the armies of angels, what they look like. In fact, he had said in a prior verse when he was talking um, about, you know, when Peter cut off the ear of, of the high priest servant when they had come to arrest him, he, he said, do you not think that I could call down legions of angels if I wanted to? I think he knew. And he saw, I, in fact, I know that he knew, but I believe he saw in this moment, there was a, there were angel armies gathered all around him, way more powerful than this army of men. And he knew the real battle that was being fought, a battle much more intense and one that had to be won. He was watching and he was praying. What else? We read about how 
In verse 28, it says they stripped him and they put a scarlet robe on him. Such humiliation, right? And then to put that scarlet robe on him, we know that Jesus, you know, when we see him ascended or um, resurrected, we see him clothed in white, right? And we see him that way in Revelation. But scarlet, that, that's like the stain of sin all upon him. Like, so they exchanged one robe for the other. But you know what? I believe as Jesus was watching and praying, his eyes were not seeing that, but his eyes were seeing the robe of righteousness that he was clothed in and that he knew and that he had seen many times. And he knew it was still there, even though all of this sin was being cast down upon him, that he was literally being clothed in it. It also tells us that they put a crown of thorns on his head and they put a reed in his right hand and they knelt down before him and they began to mock him hail king of the jews all of this was about his kingship right his position of king of kings king of the earth lord uh, king of heaven and earth but i wonder what jesus was watching as this all took place Maybe he could see the crown of righteousness that was reserved for him in heaven that he knew he would be wearing in just a very short time. Maybe he could see his righteous right hand that down through history had fought for his children and he was still fighting for them even as they put this reed in his hand. And he could see his throne in heaven. He could see his throne in heaven. He saw it. And he's talking to his father about, I just believe this. The Lord has just impressed this upon my heart as I studied this and meditated on it. He knew how to watch and pray too. And we can learn so much from him. We're going to talk about that more in just a moment. But a few more, a couple more things. It tells us that in verse 30, it says they spat on him and they took the reed and they began to beat him on the head. They were literally mocking his very character. They were spitting upon the Son of God, the Messiah, the King of Kings, the King of the world. They were spitting on him. What was he seeing? What was he watching in that moment? I don't think I know all of it by any means. In fact, I think there's a lot of things we're probably still not seeing here. But I believe that he could see one day Every nation, every tribe, every person who was even bowed down in front of him right in that moment mocking him, as we're told in the book of Philippians, that every tribe and tongue is going to bow down before him. Every knee will bow down before him. And I, you know, as Jesus knows all, could see all things, that he was looking ahead to that moment and seeing that and knowing, yes, this, this grievance, this, this hurt, this, this mockery is coming in this moment, but he knew how to look into the eternal moment and to see what was coming and to see every knee bowed down before him because he truly was the king of kings. He could judge that moment in righteousness. And then lastly, we read in verse 32 about how they pressed Simon to carry the cross of Jesus. You know, for all that Jesus had done for so many people, he fed them, he healed them, he had raised some from the dead, and so much more, teaching them, pouring out his life for them. And then not one person was able to be found to help in his hour of need, in his time. The, the soldiers literally had to force Simon to carry the cross. How that must have hurt. But you know what? I believe even here, Jesus was watching and he was praying. And what was he seeing? Well, maybe he was seeing believers who would willingly take up their crosses and follow him. Believers like you and me, hopefully you're doing that. And hopefully I'm doing that every day, just, just like Jesus instructed us to do. And although Simon was having to be pressed in this moment, and he did it, and we don't know what was going on in Simon's heart, but it does say they had to urge him. They had to press him to do it. It wasn't like he said, oh, I'll help. No, he had to be pressed to do it. But now, down through the ages, Jesus has seen not everyone, but so many pick up their crosses and follow him. Well, I believe in this moment, Jesus was seeing us. Maybe he was seeing you and me already in that moment. And that allowed him, that gave him the strength, that gave him what he needed in that moment to be in a place of righteousness, to not fall into sin, to exhibit that self-control. Jesus doesn't just call us to watch and pray. He himself watched and prayed. 
He watched and prayed. And I think literally that we could go through all the chapters, 26, 27, 28, verse by verse, and consider what Jesus might have been seeing as he was watching and praying. Instead of responding to those moments, and we see that he did it. He did it. It was like he was already in another place, in his mind, in heaven. That he was already living for a kingdom that is not of this world. And we know that he was. We could, we could go through verse by verse and all of these verses in these three chapters, but I'm not going to do that today. Maybe you'll want to do that and really um, do the same thing that I was just doing with these handful of verses to do that um, in your own study time. And I definitely encourage that. But really, I, I want to take this to, a, to another place right now and draw um, the same concept, not across more of these verses, but really across your life and my life too. To ask ourselves, how can we watch and pray? Now, we asked that last month as I, I shared with you about watching and praying, and there were six things that I encouraged you to watch and pray for. One of them was to watch for truth to see beyond the, the moment, just like Jesus was doing here, to watch for truth. You know, if you were with us in January, this might even ring true with you uh, for that passage in Psalm 27 that we studied. Because watching for truth is that, is that moment when Jesus, when you're in his tabernacle, right? When he picks your feet up on the rock and then your head is lifted above your enemies all around you and you can see things differently. We talked about that. Well, when we're watching for truth, we see things differently. So for instance, maybe you feel you know, very alone. Well, maybe you can watch into the kingdom of God and see yourself sitting in the throne room of Jesus. Do you know the doors of that throne room have been thrown wide open because Jesus resurrected for you, right? So you can go in there at any time. You know that Jesus has told you, I will be with you forever, even to the end of the age. So you can see yourself with him when you feel alone, when, when, you, when you literally are alone and you hate that feeling, you can watch and pray. You can see a different reality, just like Jesus did. Maybe you don't have what you need. And you know, in, in this time in our world's history, a lot of people don't have what they need. We're all struggling with different challenges, but maybe you've lost your job. Maybe your husband has lost his job. Maybe you, know, you need teachers for your kids and you're having to have your kids at home with you. I mean, there's so many different scenarios. You don't have what you need. You know what? You fix your eyes on Jesus. You watch into the realm that he has called you in of faith to believe that he's your provider. That just like he stood on this earth and he, he you know, multiplied um, two, two um, fish and five loaves of bread, that he can do that over and over and over again, all the times in scripture that he's your provider. And you begin to see into those moments and to just, you know, um, call out for them and ask him to do that and look for him to do that. That's where your eyes are in that moment when he is going to provide, not in the moment where the, where the pressure's on and the, and the heat is, you're feeling it from every side. Maybe you're feeling invisible or unworthy, like maybe somebody has just totally neglected to even see you or see how you feel or um, you know, listen to your thoughts. You know what? You can watch. And remember with your eyes that your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. You're not invisible to the God of Heaven. You're not invisible to your Father. There's so much that we can see when we experience moments that are hard. We'll never probably experience what Jesus experienced here. I pray that we don't. But you know what? If He can do this in Him, we can have the same kind of practice in our life of watching and praying and seeing into the reality of what is really real in God's kingdom. I mean, maybe you're frustrated, right? And we all get frustrated, again, especially in this season. It's just, it's just brought on such a, a different realm of challenges and dynamics to deal with. Well, you know what? When Jesus was on the cross, he took on all the brokenness of sin and death all the brokenness of this world. You're frustrated, you see him on the cross and it's already been dealt with. He already has an answer for it. You look to that, you watch into that, you watch for the truth. You're hurting, 
you see Jesus literally binding up your wounds, like getting inside your heart and wrapping them in his love. Recently, as uh, I, I, m many of you know, I practice communion every day and I've been leading uh, many people in a study of that, right in Matthew 26, 27, and 28 over the last couple of months as well. But I, uh, I've gotten into where lately I've been having my time with the Lord in the morning. I'm uh, sitting right at my um, at our island. We have some bar stools there. And I don't know, just the other day, I felt like the Lord just drew my gaze to just look beside me to the chair that's right there and just to imagine him sitting there. And then it was like he was saying to me, I am right here, Sharon. You need to be that aware. You need to watch and see me there. Like when you are hurting, that I'm here, literally here to talk to you about it. You're not just having to look backward, but I'm right here beside you to see his face, to see him smile at me, to, you know, to see his look of concern when I share some things. He really is there. We have to learn to watch and pray, to watch, to see with our eyes into the spiritual realm of things. There's so much, no matter if we're sick or, or any of these things that we've mentioned or so many others as well. To see Jesus, if we're sick, touching us and making us well, just like he did for people in the, um, in the Gospels, right? I mean, I could just continue to go through example after example, but I think you get the idea of what I'm talking about. Looking with our eyes and watching for what we know to be true, right? Watching for the truth. That's what Jesus was doing. He was living amidst brokenness and it was all being hurled down on him in fierce intensity. And he was able to stay in a place of self-control, I believe, because he knew how to watch and pray, to take his eyes beyond what he saw and felt in the moment and to take them into spiritual truth, to keep his eyes on that and then to begin to converse with his father about that. We have to watch and pray. You know, we do live in a world that the enemy has affected with death. And by death, I don't just mean physically dying. I mean the death of relationships, the death of dreams, the death of our purity, the death of, you know, dynamics in a certain way they're supposed to be, the death of family, the death of, you know, so many ways that the enemy just enacts death upon us. Part of it is a physical, literal death, but it's so much many other many other um, dynamics of death as well. And like Jesus, we do need to acknowledge it. We don't need to just say, oh, it's, oh, you know, we just rise above that. No, we live in a broken world. And that's why we experience things like COVID-19 and all the other many things that we experience. We live in a broken world. We can't ignore that and just go, oh, I'm just going to keep my, my head in the clouds and keep my eyes watching there. We've got to, we've got to acknowledge it. But remember, he acknowledged it, but he did not take on the effects of death because he knew how to fix his eyes. He acknowledged it. In fact, he took the curse of it on himself for us. And in him, right? In him, we proclaim that. We proclaim that his death has already overcome all of it for us. He died for it and he resurrected over it. And we worship him. We worship him in that, and I hope that that has been a part of your study this month. Just worship, just thankfulness and gratefulness for what Christ has done for you. But we also can follow his example of watching and praying so that we too can live in that victory and live in a place of righteousness. So much to consider. So much to practice, right? Because it takes practice to learn how to live as Christ did in these kinds of moments, and to really get strong in that practice of um, watching and praying. I really appreciate you being a part of this study. Uh, thanks for listening in and allowing me to share what God's been placing on my heart. You know we love to hear from you too, and there's lots of ways that you can do that. You can comment right here below this video. You can uh, get on the Facebook group for me and my Bible and share some things, and others will interact with you there. You can send us an email 
uh, just respond to any of the emails that we've sent out or go on our website and you can um, click on the contact tab. There are lots of ways to get in touch with us. So I want to hear from you as well and just things that God is showing you, maybe something he spoke to you during this video, something in your study time. Before we move on to the next month, which is going to be so rich too, God's word is just rich, isn't it? But before we move on, let's, let's just, you know, uh, wrap some of this up, not to where we close it off and never study it again, because we will come back to the gospel. We should be coming back to the gospel often. But to before you wrap it up, to just really solidify some things in your heart, a great way to do that is to share them. And we would love to hear from you in that regard. I hope you're planning to be a part of our May Me and My Bible Study as well. That is uh, going to begin. Um, at the first of the week. So it'll be that first Monday of the month of May. I encourage you to uh, share it with your friends, share it with your family and invite them in to joining in on the experience of me and my Bible as well. So have a wonderful day and I'll be in touch again soon. See ya.